Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I have such an exciting episode for you today with bassist and educator Joseph Conyers. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's most fantastic artists and musicians and find out why are they so amazing, how did it all happen, and ultimately, what can we learn from their journey? We've already had some fantastic guests like Larry Grenadier, Derek Hodge, Christian McBride, Rufus Reed, Justin Coughlin, and so many others. You can listen to all these episodes and more on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can go watch them on YouTube. So go subscribe, download, leave a comment, and let me know who you want to hear from next. Before I bring you today's amazing episode, I'd love to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have the clothing company, Jams World. You guys, I absolutely love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams World right now, of course. And the reason why I love it is because the fabric is made from 100% Spun Crush Rayon, and it keeps me cool and comfortable. They've been making clothing in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964. And the artwork is so unique. It's screen printed right onto the fabric, and it looks like a piece of art. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code JAZZ15, and you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase. Next up, I'd like to thank Colstein's String Shop. I absolutely love Colstein's. They are doing amazing things for the bass community. They have two amazing locations in Long Island, New York, and a killer online store. Go to colstein.com and use the promo code KD10, and you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. I'm really excited to share this episode with you today. This person is so joyful, so exciting, virtuosic, sharing. There's so many words I can use to describe this person. And of course, I'm talking about Joseph Conyers. He's currently the assistant principal bassist of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and he's been in the Atlanta Symphony, Grand Rapids, Santa Fe. He's been everywhere. And along with being a talented, amazing bassist, he's found his passion in education with a nonprofit he started called Project 440. I honestly don't know how Joseph has the time in the day to do everything that he does. You'll hear in the interview everything that he does. Joseph is also crushing it on social media. He's putting out so much content of himself playing and educational stuff. Check him out on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and his YouTube channel. It is so amazing. I can just describe him as joyful. So without further ado, here is Joseph Conyers. <laughs> well, cool. I, I so appreciate you taking the time because I know you're um, very very busy and in, in all, all good good ways and good directions so the, the honor is all mine yeah oh thank you um i'd really love to find out because i didn't i mean i dug deep but i'd like to know about just your early history in music uh because yeah. there's so much stuff from curtis on documented but I'd, I'd love to know you're such a joyful person you can i could just see it right now while you're playing so i just kind of want to know where that joy and passion began how that began Oh, that's a that's a great question, and I never had it quite framed that way. I love I, I love that. Uh, well, so I think I don't come from a household where everyone was doing music. Like everyone, well, 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 let me rephrase. I don't come from a household where the parents were in music, and then that, of course, then made us do music. Mm -hmm. My mother is an amateur singer. My dad worked um, uh, basically the administrative um, work for a, um, a local college, actually the college where my parents went to school, Savannah State. University now, go Tigers. All right, so anyway, <laughs> um, uh, and my mother loved classical music, um, loved singing. She did not sing professionally, but that's what she did for, um, for, for fun. And she wanted all of her kids to learn how to play. And this is because she heard classical music on the radio as a child and actually fell in love with it and said, yeah. I want my kids to be able to do that. And she, um, later talking to her, she would say, well, I know what it takes to play an instrument, I think that's good for my kids. So let me have all my kids play. So we all played. I started piano when I was five. My sister was cello at five because we're twins. <laughs> and an older brother who started violin at nine. And um, we kind of became the Von Conyers family <laughs> <laughs> in Savannah, Georgia. We played all the time together. Literally like little trios and church programs all the time. Yeah. Okay across the city and um, yeah. And as far as the joy component, I think the easiest way to answer this, Katie, literally, and I, I as, again, I'm so happy you asked the question in that way. When I talk about a lot of my musical roots, I talk about gospel music. I very much grew up in the church, black gospel music, mm -hmm. music I still love to this day. And all that music is, is joy. Mm -hmm. It literally, it's expression. So it's almost like, because for example, I sang in the choir, Katie, when I was a kid. 
They didn't ask me. They didn't, I didn't do some audition. I didn't have to read music. You want to sing the choir? Come on now. And so you can just express and express joy and express, mm -hmm. be part of the musical experience. And I think that has always been my approach to music. It's accessibility and music making is that it's not, of course we learn the technique. Um, I mean, we weren't planning on going to whatever, like some music competition or anything. We were just sing, it was singing and singing in the church. So, um, but as a classical musician, I know you learn the technique so I can express even more joy mm -hmm. in that way. And it, it empowered me. So again, I love how you asked that question because it really does, I think the joy component really does come from that unabashed, like I'm making music because I love doing this and I want to express myself in this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that's, I think that's that, that translates to my playing today. Well, it definitely does. And, and there's something to be said. I think a lot of people, I mean, I grew up singing in the church choir. Like you said, it's just like uh, the grownups are in church. You're going to go do this. For exactly. while, while, um, <laughs> but th there is like almost an instant gratification without even knowing technique, whether you start singing or you hit a keyboard, right? Or you pluck a note on the bass. There's going to be a sound that happens whether or not you know what you're doing. So it's, right. and I love... Um, you know, hearing people's stories or when you see a kid, I finished a concert with John Clayton and somebody's like little, little boy came up and he was plucking my, I let him play my bass and it was just like, you know, the lights. And um, yeah, I think that joy really carries on. Yeah, I, I, and we should never lose it because that's what makes music special. It should never become, I think once it becomes like a, re, like a job or like something, it, then we, we lose that, that magic and I think that's why a lot of people sometimes get jealous about musicians. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they say, oh, musicians, oh, you, 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 they might say, oh, well, you just play music all day. I mean, but of course there's all the work that goes into it. But I think, I think the other component of that is the fact that we can bring our, our authentic selves in a way that is very hard to do in a lot of other structures in life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so unabashedly and, and so, so freely. And for that reason, it's very freeing. We actually have all this liberty in a way um, uh, uh, others don't. So I think that to, to have that joy and to show that appreciation for that ability is just, yeah, it's just great to have. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it's true. It's not to say, like, my, my mailman is so happy. He loves delivering mail. <laughs> you know, and that, that makes him happy. So yeah. we, we can do that in other professions as well. So when, when did the bass come into play for you? Uh, when I was 11 years old. So my brother and sister were always going off to play in rehearsals with their friends. And I'm at the, at the piano doing my hand and exercises. And it was, it was very, very lonely. And <laughs> I, I think the other component, actually, we were just uh, in what we were just talking about is I love the idea I could do this with other people. I don't have to have joy. I mean, like, you know, if yeah. you're in a choir, you're by yourself, you're with all these people and you're making um, uh, a joyful noise together. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in that regard, I wanted to be able to play with friends. And of course, I could play on piano, but, you know, piano is not like in the orchestra. Yeah. So I was looking around for instruments to play and I have something in common with um, someone else you interviewed, Christian McBride, because he said he gave the trombone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. look, the trombone was supposed to be my instrument. I was supposed to play the trombone, but I never even got a trombone in my hands because at the school I went to, the strings teacher needed bass players and she knew I already played piano. And she was like, that kid is playing the bass and the rest is history. So I started playing the bass. Um, uh, and you know, what's also funny about that is actually another instrument I looked at was actually vibes. Wow. Oh, vibes. And because there was a strong jazz program at the school and all the jazz kids always seemed to be super cool. So I wanted to figure yeah. out how can I be with the super cool instead of playing the Mozart, all that fun stuff. And, uh, and having grown up in the Baptist church, the pianist, play improvisatorily, is that a word? Improvisational. Let's make it a word. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, uh, the improvisation they're able to do, I was always so jealous. Mm. I was so jealous and I wanted to be able to do that. And that's something that I never really, I never, even to this day, I mean, I can fake it and I'll fake it with a smile, but yeah. it, it ain't gonna sound good. <laughs> 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 so all that to say, um, I, I, all these other possibilities, but bass ended up being in my hands and the rest is history. I kind of took off on the instrument. I, 
I enjoyed it. I fell in love with the strings. I love the sound of strings. I remember hearing Savannah Symphony play. And actually, one of my first memories, all I can think of is hearing the strings and saying, that sound is so warm. How do, we, how do I be a, a part of that? Um, so it, it, it's, it's very great and um, fortuitous, fortuitous that I ended up on the bass, uh, a string instrument, the lowest, yes. uh, of course, but um, uh, still just as soulful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we don't get as many lines in that way. And um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I fell in love with it right away and started making progress and went to music camp. And uh, I also played piano at the same time. I was mm. Musicals at my school played Sound of Music, Once Upon a Mattress, South Pacific, all accompanying for middle school and high school productions. And um, it was great. So music, again, it's almost like I created my own little music school in an environment where music, a music school like that really didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, so, yeah. All my activities uh, outside of just being a student. So. Well, yeah, having all those those different like flavors to choose from, you really learn you know, the role of bass in music, you're like, you know, you're accompanying on piano, like these great musicals, playing bass in the orchestra. Um, and it seemed like your mom knew what was up. So were you guys going out to see the Savannah Symphony like every so often? Yeah, so a few things. So my mom sang in the Savannah Symphony um, chorale, the choir. So I remember some of my earliest memories are Carmina Baron and Beethoven I. Mm. <laughs> she would sing that with the orchestra. So I remember that clear as a bell. And as I got older, uh, as soon as we are old enough to drive, and in the South, that's young. <laughs> I mean, we were, we got our learners at 15, mm -hmm. and I was driving on my own by 16. I mean, you can get your full license by 16 back then. I don't think you can do that anymore. Uh, I was going to every concert because we became volunteer ushers for the orchestra. So I could see the Pops concerts, I could see the classical concerts, and I got to go for free. And actually, it was fun. I got to meet a lot of people. And I'm sure a lot of those people are like, who's that crazy, energetic? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but it was a great, it was a great hang a, a, a few friends in the Civic Orchestra. We used to usher. It was a lot, it was a lot of fun, actually. Did you use that opportunity? Like, did you get to meet, like, the bass section in the orchestra? So my first teacher was the principal bass, David Warshower of the Savannah That's right. Symphony. Um, it was David Warshower and, um, uh, gosh, I mean, it was a small section, Steve Rick, and there was, um, George Hofer. That may not, may not ring a bell, but George Hofer is someone Edgar knows mm -hmm. because Edgar and, um, Edgar's dad and George Hofer's dad were friends and Edgar would go to Savannah to visit George Hofer's shop. And I'm saying this whole story because people are like, why is this even important or even interesting? It's because that's where Edgar met his base. Wow. Or sold Edgar his face from in Savannah, Georgia. So no <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> that's like a that's like a Lord of the Rings, like son of Meyer, like <laughs> son of Hoffer. <laughs> that's right. Um, but yeah, I so I took lessons with David Warshower, who was the greatest ever. He was so fantastic and helpful and allowed a crazy person like me to just almost do what I wanted, but with his guidance. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what made um, learning the bass easy with him. He was he was very he was not very regimented. He would actually allow me to follow my face because sometimes I pick something that was way too hard and I, I obviously couldn't play and he'd go like, well, maybe we, we can move on. But he was always supportive. Um, and um, yeah, the, I, I'm very, very grateful to have had his guidance um, when I was in high school. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm just curious, like coming from like, I mean, I studied classical bass all the way to the end of high school, but were you doing like a lot of excerpt playing uh, with him, like studying excerpts, like more orchestral things or solo pieces? It's funny you ask. So I didn't know that much about excerpts at all. I was doing mostly solos. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, yeah, mostly solo, it was all mostly solo. So I didn't know that much about the excerpt world. Mm -hmm. When I, I went to Brevard Music Center and I went to the Boston University Tangled Institute, but Brevard for three summers and BUTI for one summer. And that's why I started to learn these other components like auditioning, but I didn't know exactly what that world was exactly. If that yeah. makes sense. And uh, I remember very vividly playing my excerpts for my Curtis audition, but not really knowing what I was doing. As a fact, I remember when I played, I played Mozart 40 and uh, the proctor, who was a student, he goes, that was really good. It was really fast. <laughs> it was really, because I didn't, I mean, I, that, was a, that world was a little um, uh, uh, outside of, of, of my, my main experience. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, it, 
Hal, I talked to Hal about that, um, Hal Robinson, and he was he oh, he always said, well, if you show the musical promise, then he, the other stuff is teachable. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he saw. Well, apparently what he saw, or he made a mistake. Yeah, that I'm not. I'm not yeah. <laughs> I keep saying. I think sometimes he actually called the wrong person and then was too, too, um, uh, um, I don't know, too um, embarrassed to admit the fact that he admitted the wrong person to his studio. <laughs> he was stuck with me. But. No, he made, he made the right choice. <laughs> um, so, so still when you're in high school, you're playing in, in like the local, was it the civic orchestra? Yeah, so there's a civic orchestra. I played in the school orchestra, so I had I had strings every morning. So I was very fortunate to have that. That was really really important. Um, I also was gigging right away. This is something I tell young young players all the time. You spend all this money for lessons, and then I mean nothing against like the service industry. There are many yeah. great people who work in the service industry. Like why couldn't you? I, we could make a lot more money playing weddings, and that's what we did. Mm -hmm. So on the weekends, we would actually put groups together and play for different weddings. They'd have a a quintet, of course, with a string compliment and then the bass. Uh, um, we did that. I played musicals mm -hmm. uh, at Savannah the Theater, which was so much fun. I mean, I, all these. And the thing is, my parents are pretty strict. We weren't allowed to do a lot of stuff. But if it was kind of mu music related, then we kind of have free reign. Same for so, me. Yeah, too. I, I, I resonate with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember like driving to my Savannah theater gig and playing Little Shop of Horrors and um, um, whatever, Sound of Music in the Pit with uh, these other musicians at a paid gig when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I had a blast and I was learning so much about following and the, and the profession. And um, it's, it's amazing, Katie, looking back and not realizing how much I was being groomed to mm -hmm. be a I was actually just living and and all those experiences would have helped would help me later on in life no you're just saying yes to the opportunities yeah yeah but I, I remember that too for like i'm driving to a gig in high school and it's like uh mom i'm gonna play until you know midnight with all these guys yeah yeah go you gotta go do it and i'm like really okay <laughs> but like you said then you just you learn you just learn 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 um, so was, was Curtis like, well, and I'm guessing too, that you were, you enjoyed it. So you were probably an incessant practicer. I, I, I may have been known for practicing a little bit at Curtis because I felt like I was behind. Mm -hmm. I literally, I mean, I, I told you there, I was lucky that year. Um, uh, uh, there's more than one opening at Curtis mm -hmm. and the, um, uh, uh, actually Jeff Beecher, Jeff Beecher, he's the principal of Toronto Symphony. Yeah. Uh, he. I remember he got in a year early, so he was young. And he, I remember in bass class, we would be doing these excerpts and he like knew them like all. Oh, I was literally, that's why I said, I think he made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm sitting here like, I, I don't know this Mozart. I mean, I know who Mozart is, but this these excerpts are hard. Yeah. <laughs> I had no, no strong sense now. I felt so behind. So, I mean, I'm a pretty hard worker and I wanted to not be behind. Mm -hmm. So I just worked really hard not to be behind. Yeah. Um, uh, and I had friends who told me, uh, even at school, Joseph, you practice too much. Like, yes, even at a conservatory. Yeah. But I, I, I had a lot of stuff to learn. Um, the music part was always easy. Mm -hmm. Emoting is easy. Like hearing a friend, once I learned, particularly at a place like Curtis, as I learned the musical language, everything just became clear. All the thoughts I had in my head were just kind of ordered and I understood the process. I just had to learn how to do it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do just it. The, the sheer mechanics of it. Yeah. And so that's why um, I said I would be a better musician if it weren't for the bass, but the bass is my only, my, my bass is my only uh, medium to, um, to get what's in here out to the rest of the world because no one, no one wants to hear me sing. <laughs> well, we're glad for that. <laughs> But everyone would love to hear you sing. <laughs> voice. Yes. Um, what was it like at Curtis for you? I'm I'm just making, maybe it was probably like playing in the orchestra was maybe the first time playing in an orchestra of that caliber. Yeah. So you mean at, at Curtis? At Curtis. Oof. I remember it literally like it was yesterday. Another moment of like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. So, um, um, yeah, it was literally in, I'm not making this up. It sounds like this is like, I'm just, it literally was in a bus depot where buses were pulling in outdoors 
we are in a bus depot on the side of a mountain in Verbier, Switzerland. That is where the orchestra re was rehearsing when Verbier just had just started. The tent mm -hmm. hadn't been built yet. So we were literally rehearsing in a bus, a bus area. And we played, I still remember it, Meister Singer and and even even more crazily, um, we did a Mahler six. Started the opening of Mahler six. Those A's, dum dum dum. Katie, I just about dropped my bass. Yeah. I never heard it sound like that. You're the probably most... scared. <laughs> it, was just, it was so it was so exciting. It was so exciting, and um, everyone was like really got going for it. And I was. Just, I, I mean, I had some terrific musical experiences, but to be in an environment where everyone was going for it so hard like that, uh, it was exhilarating. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that it, yes, the, my, my orchestral experience in school was pretty <laughs> stellar. <laughs> stellar, yeah, it was great. Oh yeah, that's, that gave me goosebumps. That gave me the chills, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, at Curtis, like you said, it's a conservatory and people were telling you that you practice too much. Um, but how was, how did you find the camaraderie with, within the students for you? Like, how was the experience? It was great. I mean, I think having, um, uh, an upbringing where I was not necessarily hanging out all the time, although I love the freedom to be able to hang out, that I, yeah. would, not, <laughs> I would not lie, but, um, uh, I was able to find even in a, such a small environment because it's only 160 people people at the school. Yeah, uh, a circle of friends who were really super supportive and who are still dear friends today. And um, yeah, you kind of, I found my little niche. And I mean, w whether it was like listening to music, sometimes it was listening to music or going to concerts. I would see the Philadelphia Orchestra play, um, and yeah, it, it, it was it was. I had a really really great experience um, mm -hmm. uh, at school. I never felt isolated. I think some people sometimes feel, say it can be isolating in school. I think because I was always so busy. Yeah. Because um, I mean, I even at Curtis, I actually took academics seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so I was studying and um, uh, wasn't doing a ton of extra extracurricular. Although I mean, I was on the student council, being involved in the school, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I could see that. Yeah, um, but other than that, yeah, it was great. I had a great, great time where I'm dear friends and learned a great deal about music and music making. Yeah, and, and you got to study with Hal Robinson and Edgar Meyer. Yes, Edgar came in my last year. Oh, nice. So Edgar came, he started um, uh, my last year with a few lessons and uh, it was great. I mean, Hal and Edgar, they're, <laughs> they're very different, <laughs> but very but great. I mean. I remember um, it was just, I don't know, I always talk to people about music and, and I say music found me, I didn't find music. And I think that's really true of a lot of us in, in, in this field because I, I while how, how embodied everything, I was like, yes, that's, yes, play it like that. Yes, it was all, and I was like, yes, teach me. I want to do that. That's the direction I want to go. Um, uh, I think the most revelatory part about that is it was, was the camaraderie is not the word. It's like the, um, we were already connected in a way mm -hmm. before we, I mean, you know, it's like when you find a good person, like you're a good trio, yeah, you're yeah. like, everything's just grooving because everything's, this is right. This is how we do it. Yeah. And, I always felt like that was the the relationship with with how and it was great because I could learn from him and he's such a warm, generous person, unbelievably warm and generous. Mm. And um, uh, so in, while <laughs> I showed up to my first lesson wearing a tie and he was like, uh, he, he goes, he, he goes, don't ever come to a lesson wearing a tie and please call me how. <laughs> 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 so I, I got rid of the tie. I called him Hal. But I mean, that was just to I mean he could see the respect I was trying to bring mm -hmm. to him uh, uh, um, in, in, in the lessons. But uh, and then Edgar, Edgar was it was so fantastic because I think with Edgar, Edgar it was learning that there are no rules. Mm. All the things that you learn about are, are how can I say, are guides to help us on our individual journeys. But nothing's written in stone. Um, nothing's written in a way. Uh, where this is the way you have to do it. Yes. And even though, Katie, I have um, the TikTok um, uh, um, family, uh, some have criticized 
my bow grip, which I know is controversial. <laughs> I, I take that criticism. I with um, it, it hit my soul. <laughs> Basically, the whole point is like I, I found what worked for me. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, and and it's it's I know it's strange. I don't teach my students to hold the bow that way, but I do explain why I hold the bow that way. And for anyone who is interested in listening, it's it's actually it's a backloaded grip that a lot of players in Philadelphia have, including Hal. But Hal's hands are much smaller than mine, mm. so his backloaded grip makes his bow grip look perfect. My backloaded grip looks like I'm holding the bow from underneath it, and there you have it. <laughs> That's it. Um, but I was able to make it work, and uh, so having Edgar was really um, it was really it opened up a lot of pathways and doors. Like, I mean, all the stump stuff he was doing now is very popular now and people have taken it even further. Yeah. Uh, it was great to see like, oh, just find a way, just find a solution. That's what we were a musician. You have to find a way, make it work, go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, everybody, everybody is different. All there's no, there's no base size. There's no one base <laughs> size, right? We're, we were left out somehow within the string family. So right. yeah, exactly. And I always say, as long as you're not hurting yourself, you know, do what works for you. Correct, correct. As long as you're not hurting yourself, because there are definitely ways that some people, um, there are definitely ways that, that some people approach the instrument that might need some addressing. So yes, I thank you for making that clarification. <laughs> I'm not saying do whatever you want, because it will work. Yeah. Uh, it has to be well informed and well thought out, out and it does not hurt you physically <laughs> in the short or long term. There's so a, P a PSA. That's the Hinterville asterisk. Yeah. <laughs> You just saved me probably a lawsuit. <laughs> I appreciate it. Of course. Uh, so did you know at, while you were at Curtis, like, did you have a goal? Like, I want to audition for orchestras. I want to be a soloist. How, like, I want to um, lay the bricks for today. That's another great question. Um, because no one's ever really asked me about that. When I was, I was sewing a little bit when I started school. I had some gigs, I had some playing gigs. Uh, I did Kutsevitsky concerto with the Flagstaff Symphony, and I did the Didgerdorf concerto with the Alabama Symphony. Um, and were those uh, based on like a competition win or just? None of them were competitions, they were phone calls. Wow. Really strange. <laughs> it was really <laughs> strange. <laughs> um, uh, and so I was doing a lot of sewing, but yeah, I it never I never saw myself becoming a soloist. Mm -hmm. I think maybe early on I, I may have considered it, but I once I was in school, I think I was pretty much the orchestra is probably the route I'm going to take. Now I still solo. Uh, I've actually done a ton of orchestra performances, but I've only played one recital in my entire life. Only one. Wow, we need to make that bump it up to two. <laughs> um, I mean, Maybe to have a getting putting a program together in quarantine, but uh, uh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, because I played lots of Kutsevitskis, I played a few Dittersdorfs, I played a few Bodicinis, and I just done Tan Dunn actually for the first time a year and a half ago. And I was actually supposed to do it later this month, but it was canceled because of the pandemic. So, um, uh, so I do solo a little bit, but I don't see myself as a soloist. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's so different from what I do on the stage in chamber music and in, in orchestral playing. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I, I think I'll, I, I knew I was, my, the goal was to be in an orchestra. Mm -hmm. I just know which one. And did you, did you take, I, I know some people take auditions while they're still studying. Did you try any of those? I did. I did do a few. My very first audition, I still have the letter in my locker at work because it was for the Philadelphia Orchestra to be on the sub list and I did not get on it. <laughs> and it was fine, it was, my, it was my very first audition. I was a, a junior and um, I learned a lot from that experience. Mm -hmm. I know I wanted it. And I, I just, for, for your listeners, I think that's important to hear. Like I really wanted and I really worked for it, but the time wasn't, it wasn't the moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I took it and instead of looking at it as something to be mad at, I looked at something to learn from. It's like, okay, well, what do I need to do to make sure that next time it happens, it works out? And then, then yeah. that's the rest of my career. It uh, obviously did work out, but like also you walk away going, well, I just learned or really worked on these excerpts. Right. So there, exactly. it, was, it wasn't a loss. It, it never is a loss, Katie. That's so important because I think a lot of people feel like, oh, I did all this work and it's never for nothing. It's just, it actually is less work you have to do for the next one. Yeah. Because there really is 
next one. Um, uh, and it just kept takes your level of refinement that much higher. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I did actually, I had some, uh, sounds a little bit like bragging, but I'll just say I had some decent success on the audition trail. Let's, let's call it beginner's luck. Okay. <laughs> Lots okay. of finals and close calls. I was runner up for my, um, for my, for, for, so the orchestra was my first sub audition and I took a, uh, orchestra section position did not advance. And then this is important, did not advance. Neither did the person before me advance. Mm -hmm. And then the very next audition was for principal bass. I can I'll, I'll identify the orchestra, the Indianapolis Symphony. I'm in the finals and the person before me at that same audition was also in the finals, ended up winning the job. Uh, uh, and that was Rufong mm -hmm. uh, with the Indianapolis Symphony as principal. And, um, uh, and I think that goes to, for two things. One, each audition prepares you for the next, but two, one orchestra was looking for one thing and another orchestra was looking for another. Yes. I mean, yeah. here you have the two finalists, the very next audition, two finalists are two people who were knocked away in the first round of the audition before. So it, 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 and Katie, there's, I mean, there's one orchestra in particular I've auditioned for three times and never got past the first round ever. Mm -hmm. And I ba built my whole career based off that experience. It would, I would say like, oh, well, I, this is, maybe I should take up, I don't know, pottery or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's important, and you know, I mean, you know this, uh, in the orchestra field, some orchestras want one thing and some orchestras want another. And sometimes you just have to be willing to just to pack your bag, bring your, your, your bag of tricks, mm -hmm. open up your box, show them, and if they want it, they'll take it. If not, then you just pack up and move on. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it really is terrible to hear as a, as a student, because you know you just want it to happen, but at the same time, I hope it's a little bit empowering to say like, well, it just wasn't for me and I can mm -hmm. get ready for the next one. Yeah. yeah. And ultimately you have to sound like you when Absolutely. you're playing. Cause I was going to ask when you're preparing for specific orchestra auditions, like, are you trying to sound like that? If there's recorded material from that orchestra, are you trying to sound match the sound of the orchestra where you're just playing the way you play? I never once listened to an orchestra or a conductor or recording, um, to, to, um, decide how I was going to play. Mm -hmm. I may have looked it up for research and a whole various whatever, um, but I, I want to be able to bring my, my, again, my, going back to the opening, my authentic self. Yeah. Uh, and some, for some people, I'll be honest, it scared some people. Some people are like, whoa, that kind of, whoa, what is he doing? No, oh, that's too much. I mean, I, I mean, what, I, one of my favorite comments, oh, and this was for a big orchestra. I will not disclose the orchestra, but it was for a biggie. <laughs> I took an audition and one of the comments said, um, too musical for an audition. Mm. That was one of my comments, Katie. So it was too musical. So it wasn't too musical, period. Or like I was going, it was too musical for an audition. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So I'm supposed to take all musicality out of, I, that is not my authentic self. And mm -hmm. I did not end up there and neither did I, <laughs> I advance in that audition. And that's fine. And that's okay. Yeah. And um, it's, it's subjective. And like you said, one orchestra wants one thing, another wants another. Uh, I, I sat in one time, my sister orchestras, um, manages a youth, the American Youth Symphony in Los Angeles. Okay, yeah. and so I sat in for their uh, concert master. I was help, helping with that. And I was just like, they all sound great, but they, and they were, were fantastic, but they each had their own, like you're saying, musicality thing that they brought to it. It wasn't like, okay, we all sound the same. And it was really interesting because I had never sat in on that type of a caliber position before. And I was like, well, they're all great. How are you guys going to decide? But you're looking for something. <laughs> and that's neat. I mean, I think, I mean, for me, it's being able to say, this is my palette. Now, if you want me to do something different, ask me to do it. And yes. then I'll do it. Yeah. Don't just assume I can't do it because I didn't do it the way you wanted me to do it. Just ask me to do it and I'll do it. You know, I actually spent a lot of time in conservatory to learn just to do that. So just ask me to do it and I'll do it. Uh, and that's really important for, for those out there as well. Like, yes, you can have your own authentic self, but at the same time, if someone asks for something like a, the music director in a final round, cause it's totally happened to me, play it with no vibrato, play it this way, can you play it at this tempo? Do, I mean, one conductor came up on the stage and started conducting me on the spot. Mm. So I follow him on the spot. And if we can't do those things, um, uh, then those are things that we have to make sure we can refine. So we have that flexibility 
as a player and as an artist, because that's what our job is in the orchestra. I know it may seem glamorous and, and, and it's great. I have a great profession, all this fun. But at the end of the day, we are literally doing what someone is telling us all the time. Mm -hmm. The conductor says, do this. We go, hey, we do it. The conductor says, I can't just all of a sudden want to do this because that's the way the spirit moves me. The spirit is inside of me and it will <laughs> stay inside of me for this because I this is for the whole. So I and, and so when you prepare for an orchestra audition, you have to have that kind of mindset. Like, how malleable am I as a player? Mm. How flexible? I mean, I've seen it in auditions where um, a, a, a player, the conductor asked for non vibrato and the player could not do it. Mm -hmm. They just could not play with non vibrato. And um, uh, and it, it, it can cost the position. So knowing how to do, okay, if I'm doing, I'm going to do non vibrato, what do I do with my right hand? Mm -hmm. Make sure the color is still really pristine and has a lot of um, uh, uh, flair and um, depth to it. Yeah. Uh, instead of just relying on my left hand all the time to create the color and the depth. So anyway, all these things we learn in school and which is why it's important to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. But the auditions really help 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 with that because you, you learn like, oh, I need to be able to do right. all this or it's good to be able to do all this. Um, when did, your your passion for teaching and education come into play so because i'd love to talk about project 440. yeah no this this uh, this this comes up too and i think this is also in my blood because my mother while she was an amateur singer she was a teacher uh and i saw she taught high school all through um our our growing up and uh taught a lot at at the church sorry i was living at church like six out of seven days a week when i was a kid so i think a lot of things go back uh uh to that but seeing her um uh teach and interact and again going back to that message of like how are we helping people and the thing is i i'm really fortunate to be where i am but like but it sounds kind of weird but it's like i care and i appreciate it and it's wonderful but at the same time it's not about me in which mm -hmm. case i don't care because what's to me more, more important now that I've reached, made it to this level, how in the world can I help someone else out so that they can have the same opportunity? Yeah. And there's so many kids, Katie, so many, so many. I live in a big city, Philadelphia. So many kids who, if just given the opportunity, they will shine like the sun. Yeah. Uh, but so many in society, so many in their communities, so many have um, uh, dismissed them simply because of where they may have grown up, what their zip code is, how they even just look. And uh, to me, that's a travesty. It's a travesty not only for music, but it's a travesty for humanity. Yeah. Because we should be looking at each other, how can we be helping each other and lifting each other up? So we, because we're all on this earth together. It's not like one people or one part, we're all on this earth together. So. To me, and this is me speaking for myself, <laughs> we should be doing everything we can to uh, to make it so that everyone can live the life they want to live. And Katie, if I, I if I were a, a, a football player, I'd run a football program. Yeah, I just happen to be a musician. And music, what's great about music is there's so many different touch points, and this goes into my organization, Project for Forty. There's so many touch points in music by itself, whether it's the training whether it's the camaraderie, whether it's the um, critical thinking that a, a student has to go through, that are skills that are transferable to real life, regardless mm -hmm. of what one wants to do. And that's what Project for 40 literally capitalizes on, is using literally music as a tool. We don't teach music. We're a music organization that doesn't teach music. We use music as a tool to teach entrepreneurship, leadership, and service, mm -hmm. so that we can develop the best citizens of tomorrow and have the students reach their highest potential makes us very happy. Yeah, I mean, and there's no, I mean, by now there's been plenty of statistics, um, reports and everything done, like, just like you're saying, you don't have to play music, you don't have to be a musician, but if you learn to appreciate it and learn what it is, uh, just statistically, you're going to be elevated. Right. Like your I, intellect. There's so many, it, it gives, it, it, I mean, again, I'm not a sports person, so still people don't come after me about <laughs> I'm not a sports person, but I'll talk about music. Music connects with history. Mm -hmm. Music connects with humanity. Music, the, the music connects with science, because literally music is science at its core. So, mm -hmm. there's so there's so many entry points that we can use. Um, uh, and that's why I advocate for music education, because if kids can be introduced to that early on, they can start to see those points of connectivity. And again, they may not become professional musicians, 
but the concept and having gone through that process will allow them to do whatever they decide to do even better. Yeah. And I mean, you're just helping. I, I forget. I think there is a term for it, but like just the lost intellect of kids, uh, you know, no matter the minority, just because they're not exposed to what you're doing, art in general. And so, especially during the pandemic, I think there's going to be, a, you know, we're going to see some, you're literally, you're not tapping into somebody's potential. You're not yeah. allowing someone to reach their potential because you're not, not you, but we're not showing them. We're not giving them anything. Right. I mean, I mean, Katie, I tell the story all the time. It's a, one of my aha moments uh, being in, in Georgia and uh, a poor part of town and seeing these kids playing on a porch. And my mom said, among one of those kids could be a genius and Einstein and no one will ever know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that th that's what's, <laughs> I mean, people can probably come up with every reason in the book on why we shouldn't help people or why we can't, or why we can't, not shouldn't, yeah. why we can't because it's too hard, blah, blah, blah. But literally, the cure for, for cancer, the cure for all, literally could be in these communities sitting right there, never given the opportunity to realize that potential and give us an answer. So if there's any incentive, well, I mean, let's start there. <laughs> just <Yeah. say. laughs> just, well, how can we just provide that opportunity just so um, those Katie's out there, those Joe's out there, whatever, in, in whatever field or profession can, can, can rise and get the access that they need and maybe make some um, uh, substantial contributions that could be, be for the rest of time. I mean, that's exciting. Yeah, literally, I know. You, you, and you literally, then all of a sudden, if you drive around the neighborhood and you see all these kids, you, you, instead of being like, oh, I, it's been like, no potential. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's, let's start a program. Let's get these kids to learn. Let's, because it's good for them. It's good for the community and it's good for the city that in society. Anyway, don't get me. I, <laughs> on and on because it actually riles me up a little bit i i just yeah. can't stand the fact that you can live in a world where people will just turn their back that's very foreign to me katie yeah that's very foreign to me and um i just can't i can't turn my back so that's why um i'm so involved with the work with project for 40. um i'm involved with the kids here in the school district and the all city orchestra and being able to work with them i'm very passionate about that and uh, when it comes to community engagement and youth initiatives and orchestras, I feel like that's where a lot of orchestras miss the ball. Um, yeah. But not because some are doing, have great music programs. So, because I know some people might say, well, we have a great youth orchestra, whatever. So, <laughs> so fine, you have a great youth orchestra. But again, like, how are we in the industry thinking about utilizing music, not just to create musicians, but to create better people? Yeah. That's the power that has been underutilized in our industry, in my industry. Mm -hmm. and, so, I mean, uh, um, and classical music. And uh, again, when you think about what if we do start to do that, then I become very excited about the possibilities for the profession and also for society at the same time. And isn't that a great way to think about it? Yeah. Again, it's not like just for music, it's for humanity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, I yeah, no, like music being a conduit to like all sectors of society and professions. Cause like, you know, people just think, oh, you're, you're a musician, you just do music or something, right. but it can really elevate society. And I'm sure, um, I mean, it must, whether like the students realize it or not, like it must feel empowering to see someone like yourself, like visually reflecting what they look like. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I it's weird cause I never thought that much about it. And actually that's a, I mean, if you want to talk about social media, that's a neat segue, yeah. <laughs> actually, because um, one of the, I never imagined. I mean, I just never imagined I'd be where I be, where I am. It's just a very strange thing, and I sometimes I live life so I'm so busy, my head is buried in the sand all the time, and all of a sudden I look up and go like, "Whoa, how'd I get here?" <laughs> Back to work. <laughs> um, uh, and and with the with social media. I went, and it was because a student was like, Mr. Connors, you should start posting videos. People will love them. I'm like, really? Like, like people, I'm like, okay. So I did a few and I started getting messages from around the world, Katie, mm -hmm. around the world, um, from young people saying, you are such an inspiration. It's great to see you. I, um, I mean, I just got like yesterday, I see someone who looks like me in classical music. I feel like I can do this now too. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, is that something I asked for? No, but it's actually something I'm 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 proud to represent because uh, people worked really hard. Yeah, 
enabled me to be where I am today. So I'm, I'm ha willing to do all I can to help someone else have, again, have the same success. Yeah. Yeah. And you just did it unknowingly. You're like, this is, this is what I do. This is what I do. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And, and, and it's been fun and then it's fun. And it's actually helped me, kept me accountable because I got so busy once Katie, uh, I will, I'll share this with your listeners. <laughs> I, <laughs> I got so busy that, um, I didn't know how long I'd be playing. Mm. To be honest. Maybe like five years ago, I, I didn't know. I love playing, but, and I've said this in a, in a speech or two, I didn't, um, I didn't know if I was more valuable on the stage or off the stage. Yeah. And worse, I, I, it was sad to me that the profession was making me have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so I, I did, I just, uh, how can I say, worked all I could or do all, do, do, did all I could, um, uh, to get beyond that. And with social media, when I, when you have to make a post every some, certain number of days, yeah. like it was holding me accountable because it was like, oh, I've got to like take out my instrument and play it and do something. Uh, so for that reason, I've actually really enjoyed it because so um, uh, cause a lot of people feel like with social media, it's about the person. Yeah. But for me, it's actually about, about me being able to share. Yeah. Uh, and then that, that love comes back to me because um, uh, you create this, this, this family. I mean, you are very familiar with this, Katie, because of the family that you, <laughs> you have uh, created and inspired in all your amazing work, which well, is... So your uh, your TikToking is above everyone. I mean, how, you're you're so good at that. Is it fun? Like, so it is. Like, you enjoy it because it's, and I like that too. It's like, okay, I gotta, I need to hold myself accountable. I feel that same way. But you're like the way you put these videos together on TikTok, especially. They're so a lot of them are so educational. I mean, they all are. But like, how long does it take you to prepare? I mean, you have sixty seconds, right, to get a point across. Right. That's also a like a challenge. Um, and you, you'll be talking about Mozart or like playing a specific piece. So like, then just like in a ballpark, like how much time does it take to do one 60 second post? All right. It's okay. This is such a fair question. I'm so happy because I've actually been trying to promote, um, promote this guy. So it's, I have help okay. <laughs> for TikTok. I have help. I cannot TikTok to be honest is probably one I'm most removed from uh because we just started that account because i didn't have a tiktok account because i was like shit he put how do you do, he like put a picture of the, in the video i was like so what those video those snippets are actually from some of my longer youtube videos and they'll take a, 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 a 60 second snippet from that and they'll add the, the the effects and then it will be on tiktok so i do respond on tiktok although not recently not as much as i should be because it's, it's a lot. It's hard. But I mean, the YouTube project is big. Uh -huh. It's so much time. And I just uh, started this initiative, Play Me an Excerpt, um, where folks right. can play an excerpt. And uh, I'll give that um, a feedback. And we're actually trying to get guest artists to be on the show to give feedback. And again, it's just to make people feel comfortable. And I think it's a place where a lot of people can learn. But that takes a lot of time because there's a lot of editing and all these moving parts, but the team has been been great. So I have to a big shout out to William Valencia because <laughs> he's actually a student of mine at Temple who's been um, helping me out with with a lot of the content. Instagram is all me. Instagram okay. is completely me. Okay. Uh, they they have no access to that account, but uh, YouTube and uh, uh, YouTube I create the content and then they make it packageable. And then TikTok they actually run on their own. So okay. That's how that it's good. I'm glad to know that you have some elves. Helping me. <laughs> um, I oh I love I love um, working with one of your uh, he's from Philadelphia Dan McCain and yeah. yeah and I was like I was like do you know Joseph he's like yeah of course I do <laughs> um, but I can definitely tell um, you made an impression on him because his work ethic is just so strong oh that's amazing that's super that's super great to hear I'm I'm not. No, I feel like I saw him right before the pandemic. Maybe the, it's like right before he did. Oh, he was playing with Christian McBride. I think oh. they did a duet together on stage for the Philly Pops. Yeah, I think, <laughs> uh, yeah it was just a really, really amazing. I feel like that was right, right before. Um, but that's so I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm so happy he's doing so well. That's yeah. great. Um, it's a real call. I'll let you go in a minute. But you so you're teaching at Temple University now, yeah. Juilliard, 
I mean, you've yeah. got the All City Youth Orchestra. All City Orchestra, yeah. Uh, you've, of course, got Project 440. Yeah. And you've got the Great Discover Double Bass course out. Is that that's? Is there anything else that you're you're doing? I, I mean, the, uh, I'm the artist uh, in residence and artistic advisor for the Boston University Tango Institute now. Oh wow! Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. I'm really excited because uh, the Tango was so transformative for me. So it's great to be there on um, uh, um yeah, literally helping to make artistic decisions for the students and the experiences that they have. At, oh yeah, a place that literally changed my life. It was yeah, great. isn't that amazing? I mean, like Philadelphia Orchestra and now in Boston, like, it, yeah, it's just like a 360. That's so cool. It, it, it it's it's yeah. Sometimes overwhelming. Sometimes how the coincidences and yeah, how how small the world is. And uh, but I, I I think if 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 uh, uh, I were to leave something is with with listeners, it's um, sometimes. <laughs> We don't realize the journey that we're on. Sometimes we don't realize the journey that we've always made because we're working so hard. But I think it is really nice to be able to sit back every once in a while, as I said, like take your head out of the sand and go like, look, like these these things have happened. And am I where I exactly want to be? Man, I'm still working for there, but these things have happened and I can appreciate that. And I will make, I, I will grow from that. Mm -hmm. and, Let's now let's continue to work hard and put a head back down and go go at it really hard. So, but it is, um, yeah, it is important to acknowledge your accomplishments. Yes, yes, because um, uh, yeah, because I think so. And, and it's almost like listening to a recording of yourself um, uh, from years ago. You're like, wow, I actually did make progress. And then that moment, you're like, oh, I'm not making any progress. I suck. Like this is horrible. I'm terrible. I should quit. Yeah. And I definitely have those moments. I, 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 yes, have had those moments, but then you can look back and say, well, wow, because what we, it's, it's like the Hercules thing, the story of Hercules and how he got strong. He carried a bull every day mm -hmm. because he literally he started off as a calf, a baby yeah. cat, and then it turned into a bull, but he didn't notice the change every day. And that's what it's like with our, our learning and growth. And sometimes we just have to be able to take a thousand foot view mm -hmm. and go like, wow, I have made that, this progress. Let's keep, let's keep forging forward. That's so important. And then uh, is a stress relief for you or just like a pause from what you do? Is that where the body, bodybuilding comes into play? Yeah, so I started lifting in college and uh, I think my my teachers, I mean, David Warshaw, one of them, and my, my um, parents were like, all that energy you put in music, maybe you should probably throw some of that energy somewhere else <laughs> just to like even things out a little bit. Just yeah. Uh, trying to make me a little more well-rounded and so uh um yeah i started lifting in college and i got completely hooked i i mean i i gained 60 pounds over a few years and um I, it was great i i it just felt good and i didn't start competing until i was gosh after 30. yeah and i i think what was neat about that is i was actually looking the best i'd ever looked while i was older which is cool <laughs> The other thing about that is the detail. You start to really make the connection between music and lifting because mm -hmm. the amount of detail that like, you're looking at this muscle and can you see these muscle fibers and blah, 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 and flexing and turning the light to the light, being able to see the light and be able to, so you can show the audience. It, so overwhelming that I kind of, I haven't competed in a long time because that is just another world I don't have the energy for, yeah. um, the time for, but, uh, yeah, and it's a great stress reliever because it's, honestly, um, now that music is what I do, um, going to the gym is the hardest thing I do every day. <laughs> so when yeah. generally I try to do it first, and once that's oh, done, Katie is like, eh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's falling apart, like whatever. Like yeah. we'll figure out a way to make it work. And literally, I just it, the the stress it does keep the stress levels down because it said the hardest thing I do every mm -hmm. day is, is lift the weights. Because someone, if if I make a bad mistake, it could be debilitating. Yeah, exactly. All my energy in a, into a place, and it's it's very um, uh, um, it's very good for my psyche. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, you could introduce the double bass into the weightlifting world, uh, in like competitions, you know, <laughs> or like you know, throwing it back and forth or something. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, maybe I could use it to cover up because that is the most, that's the strange thing. When I did bodybuilding, I had done um, physique where you wear board shorts. Uh huh. When you do bodybuilding, you do not wear board no. shorts. 
is very is very board shorts or like a choir rope in comparison to yeah. like, <laughs> um uh and a face would come in handy because yeah yeah but um you it's funny how as strange that is i feel like that's helped me in other like it's just because when you're backstage like everyone like no one cares everyone looks the same everyone feels just as miserable because no one is eaten and it's slowly yeah. start so they, they look good and and um uh yeah you just it's a, a whole different kind of uh, appreciation um mm-hmm. uh for things so yeah anyway the bodybuilding has played um a big role for, again I, I think for my psyche yeah exactly okay the last thing just because i see it you've got the bases back there norma <laughs> norma and joe right no no so this is norma okay and this is riley oh riley okay yeah yes you're, yes i mean you're joe duh but, I, <laughs> but that's, that's the, the hashtag. hashtag yeah right, norma, and joe. norma and joe because it was, uh, i had norma a long time with with instagram before riley um and but yeah riley is made by aaron riley Bonary house in Grand rapids michigan um she is two years old now her neck comes off so when i played the tan done i flew with the bass for the first time learned a set of sound posts and played there and then norma has been with me for Ooh, 14 years in April, 14 years we've been together. And you'll have to, you have to celebrate. That's right. Uh, and before I owned it, it was with Bob Gladstone of the Detroit Symphony. And before Bob, it was his teacher and former colleague, Fred Zimmerman in the New York Philharmonic. Well, there so you go. Fred Zimmerman's bass. Um, if you see all the, what's it called? All the um, uh, edited by Fred Zimmerman, not not to be confused with Oscar Zimmerman. Yeah, who apparently was of no relation. Um, but uh, Fred, that used to be his bass back that's... in the seventies, sixties, seven sixties. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Well, <laughs> well, Joe, I have a feeling you're gonna do some work after this, so I'm gonna let you go. It's all good. I'm, I'm, I have a play me an excerpt. I need to get an episode finished so we can get it out to the world. <laughs> well, I so appreciate you spending uh, taking the time to do this. I admire everything that you do with education, and and I love belted out bases. You know, right. has, hashtag belted out bases. Uh, and you're just you have such a stamina and a drive, and it's really inspiring. And so, just thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much for having me, and thank you for your inspiration. I love. I mean. I haven't, I've not tried to sing while playing at the same time. That's something you have to work on. I also have to play my dad's chops because they are pretty much non-existent. But you are an inspiration to let me know that maybe one day I, I can do it. I might have to call you up for some lessons. Oh, I'll be there in a minute. All right. Well, thank you, Joseph. Have a wonderful night. Continue to stay safe. And I can't wait to hear more from you. Thanks a lot. Take care, Katie. All right. Bye.